If you think about it, cities are amazing. Cities are the accumulation of human endeavor, layer upon layer of history with the bones sticking out into the present. Long ago, people found a place that looked nice and built houses. Houses that became homes. Homes that became communities. We connected each other with social institutions, some more secular than others, and connected our homes with roads. As cities grew, new services appeared to protect the community and to serve it. New infrastructure was built, reshaping the landscape. New buildings were constructed to integrate with a global community, providing new services, new ways of making a living, and new ways of, well, living. And as the last layers of history are laid down, a city is further from its natural beginnings than ever before, and faces new challenges. In the 21st century, cities, home to over half the world's population, must adapt to a warmer climate. In fact, those living in urban areas, especially those from economically and socially marginalized communities, will disproportionately suffer the effects of climate change. With cities disproportionately contributing to the problem, they make up over 70% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So a large part of addressing the climate crisis is making our cities lower carbon. But what about negative carbon? Can we build cities that actually suck carbon out of the atmosphere? Well, according to this paper, yes. Mendez et al. proposes four key ways cities can become carbon sinks. In this video, we'll explain these four ways, implement them in our model city, and see how they measure up to the problem at hand. The first way is perhaps the most obvious, through greenery. Green spaces in cities include gardens, parks, and even forests. Expanding these will obviously draw down carbon through photosynthesis, but so too will green stormwater infrastructure. Much of the modern city is built from impermeable materials like concrete and tarmac. When it rains heavily, water courses over these materials and can rapidly accumulate, causing flooding and flushing pollution into local waterways. While this has been historically managed by pipes and tunnels, green stormwater infrastructure absorbs and filters stormwater when it falls using plants. This can be accomplished with green roofs and walls, rain gardens and bioswales. These are green spaces designed to capture runoff so it can soak into the soil over time. Managing stormwater in this way is an example of a co-benefit to a city of increasing greenery. While the main objective is to be a carbon sink, you can accomplish other things too. By protecting or building new green spaces in cities, you increase people's connection to nature, restore biodiversity, and lower temperatures. Trees provide shade and, through evapotranspiration, cool down the local area really quite significantly. Oh, and suck carbon out of the atmosphere. It's estimated that if cities really lent into greenifying their spaces, globally they could draw down between 100 and 300 million tons of CO2 every year. That sounds like a lot, but remember, last year the world emitted around 40 billion tons of CO2. Greenifying the world's cities would be the equivalent of removing the emissions of a large European country. Pretty good, but not enough. Maybe we'll have more luck with the second technique, which is a little deeper. And I mean that literally. It's the soil cities are built on. Urban soil is mostly limited in how well it can support life by its capacity to hold water and nutrients. Some scientists propose to improve soil's capacity to hold both by adding biochar. This is organic material burned at very high temperatures without oxygen, similar to charcoal. But unlike charcoal, in theory, creating biochar does not create carbon emissions. Instead, it's a way of taking carbon that might quickly make its way into the atmosphere, for example through rotting, and fixing it into a chemically stable form that isn't going to go anywhere. Add biochar to the soil or green roofs or stormwater infrastructure in a city, and you improve the growing conditions for plants, aiding biodiversity, but you also bury the carbon in the biochar for potentially centuries. If that organic material was sustainably sourced, or if it was waste product from sewage or garden waste, it becomes another carbon sink with co-benefits for the city. Sounds great, but a lot of people have problems with this idea. I'll leave a link to a paper critiquing biochar in the description, but in short, it's very possible to create this stuff in an unsustainable way, and there's no guarantee that it's a net positive for soil health. But assuming that this can be done sustainably, surely this is a way to fix massive amounts of carbon into urban soil. Well, according to Mendez et al, actually maybe just 50 million tonnes a year, equivalent to the emissions of 
Bulgaria. And even then, there's lots of uncertainty that the authors note. We may need to look at the third way of drawing down carbon for something more substantial. And you can't get much more substantial than buildings, roads, infrastructure. Similar to the previous point, if you lock carbon into a building, then it might stay there for hundreds of years. Organic building materials like wood can be an effective carbon sink, again if sustainably sourced. And while not everything can be made of timber, the list of buildings that can't grows ever shorter. New materials like cross-laminated timber and glue-laminated beams allow woods to be used in even high-rise buildings, with the added benefits of taking fewer emissions to produce and generally being faster to build with. Cities are going to expand significantly this century, and Mendez et al. estimate that if new urban construction was largely done with sustainably sourced timber products, you could draw down one or 200 million tons of CO2 a year. Still not much. However, if you're willing to accept that biochar is a possible solution, and again, many people have problems with it, but if we do, then a bigger carbon sink becomes available in cement. Cement currently has a large carbon footprint, though that's not guaranteed, I've made a whole video about this. And if you can make cement in a low carbon way, then adding biochar to it can make it more durable and a huge carbon sink. We're talking the equivalent of between 200 and 700 million tonnes of CO2 every year being locked away in new buildings. That's the biggest number we've heard so far, though it does have a lot of caveats, not least of which biochar. Before we talk about the final way of making cities carbon negative, just a brief aside about roofs. A question I get asked occasionally is, can't we just paint our roofs white and reflect some of the sunlight back and cool the planet that way? Well, the answer is yes, and the paper finds that doing so could be the equivalent of preventing 8 billion tonnes of CO2 being released. Though note that's a one-off between now and 2050, it's not 8 billion tonnes every year. You could actually also push it much further if you also made roads slightly lighter, though that obviously has an upper limit. You don't want to dazzle people. The carbon savings of doing this are pretty good, maybe wiping out a few months of global emissions. Arguably though, the bigger reason to do it is the size effect of local cooling. Similar to trees, painting roofs white can cool down the local environment by the best part of a degree. But unlike trees, you can implement this anywhere you have a roof, even on older buildings where a green roof would be impossible. Anyway, that aside, the final way the paper proposes making cities carbon negative is… well, you know how large buildings have heating and cooling systems that also circulate the air? Well, a lot of that air is carbon dioxide, two or three or more times atmospheric levels. So given that there's concentrated CO2 available in an environment with a system that already circulates air, what if we added to that system the ability to absorb CO2 and suck it out of our buildings? Doing so could remove 100 million tonnes of CO2 a year and improve air quality in buildings. But that's just capturing the CO2. You'd then have to safely store the CO2 and keep it stored, presumably somewhere out of the city, and that will be a lower number than 100 million tonnes a year. This is a form of direct air carbon capture, and to be quite honest, I'm very sceptical of this as a solution. Simply put, there are better, cheaper solutions available that we've already talked about. So hang on a minute, between the four approaches, greenery, soil, construction materials, and carbon capture, this paper estimates that you could maybe suck a billion tonnes of CO2 a year out of the atmosphere. That's about 3% of our current emissions. It's not enough. In case it wasn't clear, sucking carbon out of the atmosphere isn't how we tackle the climate crisis. We do that by reducing our emissions. Within a city, that means changing how we power our systems and heat our homes. It means changing how densely we live and how we move ourselves around. It means changing what food we grow and how we distribute it. This needs to be our priority. But that's not to say that implementing this paper's suggestions is a bad idea, because it's not just about carbon. We can improve our stormwater management, connect people with nature, improve the health of our soils and our people, and cool ourselves down. And when we do bring emissions down, a billion tonnes a year will be a big deal. By 2050, that might be a fifth of all emissions remaining from all cities. It might be what's necessary to bring us to net zero emissions. And along the way, we can make cities that are more pleasant to live in. 
for us and for other species. I hope that the cities of the middle century look something like this, the next layer of history, that says to the future, we saw the problem, and not only did we fix it, we made things better. As I mentioned, this video is based on this paper by Mendez et al, kind of translating it into everyday language. Unfortunately, a lot of science is written in language that's quite inaccessible, especially if you don't have an education in statistics. If you watch a lot of videos like this one, are interested in science but don't feel able to read actual scientific papers, then I'd recommend this course on exploring data visually, which leads on to courses on probability, data analysis, and modeling. You can try this course for free with this video sponsor Brilliant.org. Brilliant is the website and app where you can pick up new skills or support classroom learning in science, maths, and data science. As you can see for yourself, their courses are gorgeous and, crucially, interactive. Learning by just copying stuff out of a book or listening to lectures is nowhere near as effective as learning by doing, and the award-winning team at Brilliant, including professionals from MIT, Google, and Caltech, have built hundreds of courses at a variety of levels that I wish were available when I was at university. I've already mentioned their data analysis course, but you could also learn about programming, large language models, or mathematics. And as I also already mentioned, you can do so for free. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, or click the link in the description. Doing so, you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription if you choose to continue the service. That link again was brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. But thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and for being, well, brilliant. Making this board was a lot of work, but also a lot of fun. If you're interested, the buildings came from Brigade models and their 2mm range. I actually made an extra video going behind the scenes and showing you how I modelled and painted everything, which is available right now on my Patreon. Quite simply, I would not be able to make these videos without my patrons, and especially not a video like this one that took two weeks to make. They literally keep the lights on here, and in exchange they get early access to videos, they get access to exclusive content every Every month, notably a behind the scenes vlog, which is some of my editor Luke's best work, and producer tier patron and higher, whose names you're seeing on screen right now, get to vote on a video topic a month. And this video, in fact, was chosen by such a poll. So if you'd like to join those lovely people, then you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Simon Oxfizz, which is linked in the description. And if you look here, this neighborhood is inhabited by Ake Van Latham, Adrian Sand, JavaScripter, and Kim next to the mighty river Clemens. Thank you so much for supporting my work. If you enjoyed this video, please do pop it a like and share it with either the scale modeler in your life or the city planner in your life. And if you'd like to watch more hobby stuff from me, then I have a second channel that's basically just that, which is available over here. Here's two videos I prepared earlier if you'd like to watch something else right now. And that just leaves me to say thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.